trials hard to bear we're tempted to complain to murmur and despair but christ will soon appear to catch his bride away all tears forever over in god's eternal trials will seem so small when we see Christ. One glimpse of his dear face, all sorrow will erase. So bravely run the race till we see Christ. Life's day will soon be storms forever past we'll cross the great divide to glory safe at last we'll share the joys of heaven a harp a home a crown the tempter will be banished we'll lay our burden down trials will seem so small when we see Christ. One glimpse of his dear face, all sorrow will erase. So bravely run the race till we see Christ. just borrowed they're not mine at all Jesus only let me use them to brighten my life so remind me remind me dear Lord roll back the curtain of memory now and then show me where you brought me from and where I could have been remember I'm human and humans forget so remind me Nothing good have I done to deserve God's own Son. I'm not worthy of the scars in His hands. Yet He chose the road to Calvary to die in my stead. Why He loves me. I can't understand Roll back the curtain Of memory now and then Show me where you brought me from And where I could have been Remember I'm human And human forget. So remind me, remind me, dear Lord. Roll back the curtain of memory now and then. Show me where you brought me from and where I could have been. Remember, 
remember I'm human and humans forget. So remind me, remind me, dear Lord. Nothing good have I done to deserve God's own Son. I'm not worthy of the scars in his hands. Yet he chose the road to Calvary to die in my stead. Why he loves me, I can't understand. Roll back the curtain of memory now and then show me where you brought me from and where i could have been remember i'm human and humans forget so remind me remind me humans forget so remind me remind me dear Lord every Sunday morning he will make the drive down to the country church with his wife at his side shepherd of the flock sharing the word of God living his life for Jesus Christ he's faithful in the service of the Lord He's faithful, he will receive a rich reward, not boasting in what he does, but out of a heart of love. He's faithful in the service of the Lord. Faithful in her witness, she is not ashamed. Down at the factory, everyone knows her name. Often criticized, sometimes it makes her cry. Still Jesus' sweet name she will proclaim. She's faithful in the service of the Lord. She's faithful. She will receive a rich reward, not boasting in what she does, but out of a heart of love. She's faithful in the service of the Lord. Let's all be consistent. Faithful in this life, living every day in the love of Jesus Christ. For when He comes again, He'll gather His faithful friends, workers who shine the gospel light. Be faithful in the service of the Lord. Be faithful. You will receive a rich reward, not boasting in what you do, but out of a heart that's true. Be faithful in the service of the Lord. Be faithful in the service of the Lord.
Bibles to John chapter 6, the title is Who Else Has the Truth? Everybody says they have the truth. <laughs> there can't be lots of truth if they all differ from one another. In John chapter 6, it's one of the longer chapters, might be the longest chapter in the book of John, 71 verses, but Jesus had just fed the 5,000 with the five loaves and two fishes, and they were amazed. As a matter of fact, in chapter 6, verse 14, then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, this is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. They were absolutely amazed. They were out there listening to what Jesus had to say, and they were getting hungry, and pulls out this little kid's basket, lunch basket, and feeds thousands and thousands of people. They're filled. I mean, it's kind of like going to Golden Crow out there in the wilderness. I mean, it just doesn't stop. And so they wanted to notice it's truth that the prophet should come into the world. They saw Jesus as simply a prophet. And then Jesus begins to speak to them after they follow him Across the Sea of Galilee, verse 26, Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, you seek me, not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. You follow me around because you want another buffet. In other words, instead of learning something by the miracle, who in the world could perform such a miracle? They said, well, we'll just follow you and keep, keep, keep eating as long as you keep feeding us. And, and so he begins to speak to them. And he gives them some tough uh, issues to deal with. He says in verse 50 of that chapter this is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die I am the living bread which came down from heaven if any man eat of this bread he shall live forever and the bread that I will give is my flesh which I will give for the life of the world verse 53 and then Jesus said unto them verily verily I say unto you except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whosoever eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last days. Well, they were struggling with what he was saying. And they are realizing this, this, is, this is a pretty hard saying. So let's look at verse 64. But there are some of you that believe not, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and should, and who should betray him. And he, and he said, therefore, I, therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my Father. And from that time, many of his disciples went back and walk no more with him. Many of his disciples left him. And we're seeing people today, I don't know that there's anything different, people who claim to be Christians who have dropped by the wayside. You know, they may have 
prayed a prayer. They may have joined a church, were baptized, and so on. But the next thing is, they drop to the wayside. They don't really talk to God. They don't live for God. You wonder what happened. We see in this three attitudes concerning the person of the Lord Jesus Christ in this portion of Scripture. First thing we see is there's an amazing fascination. We saw there in verse 2, a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, which he did on them, that were diseased. Okay, everybody enjoys seeing something like that. Matter of fact, if you go, in, you go anywhere today and have a crusade, especially foreign countries, and say we're going to heal everybody that comes forward and, and everybody's going to leave richer than they came, and well, people will come. Of course they will. Um, everybody likes that kind of a thing. So Jesus did draw a crowd because he did perform miracles. Plus, there was no television sets back in that day. There was no movie theaters, no electronic gadgets, no radios, records, CDs, phones. That's why, it's, you know, it used to be we, we had big bus ministries. And we could pick up kids. Kids would be happy to go to Sunday school and pick them up at 9 o'clock, 8.30 in the morning, ride our buses. They didn't have anything else to do. But as times change, Satan has a way of getting in there and thwarting God's plan. And so now he's giving them all kinds of little gadgets that they can play with. They can stay up late at night, and they get up and play their gadgets in the morning, and they're just thrilled about that, and they don't have time for God. Times change. And so these people, they hadn't seen anything like that. Somebody comes through town, does that kind of miracle, and then feeds you. He says, uh, I know why you're here. You're not here because of who I am. You're here because of what I did for you. Now, he, had to he, he, he told powerful stories. I would have enjoyed hearing Jesus speak. But even people today are fascinated with spiritual entertainment and even good stories. I'm sure Jesus was interesting. They, he told parables. They contained hidden spiritual truths. And, but he also wanted to conceal certain spiritual truths from those who had rebellious and prideful hearts. See, there are some truths that Lost people can never grasp. Turn to an interesting portion of Scripture in Matthew chapter 13, if you would. We talk about the parables of Jesus, and they're just simply stories, earthly stories, that have spiritual meanings to them. The spiritual meaning is hidden in the story, like the sower is sowing corn and, and, and so on. And the, and the seed is the word of God and there's spiritual application behind it all. But notice in chapter 13 verse 10. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? Alright, that's a good question. Lord, why, why do you speak in such a way that's difficult to understand what you're saying. You got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. I mean, and he answers the question. He answered them, said to them, because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it's not given. For whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away even that he hath. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And I'm convinced that God has even written the Bible in such a way that if you don't have a heart to receive truth, 
then you all you just condemn yourself. You just simply say, that don't make sense to me. I don't understand that. And the truth is there. But only for the people who are open to the truth. And the person who gives their life to the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit comes into their heart and enables them to discern truth. That's why Jesus says, I can tell you these parables and I can share with you the meaning of them. They wouldn't, they wouldn't, they wouldn't understand it anyway because their heart's not in it. So a great number of Jesus' followers never got his message. A lot of people today do not get the message of Jesus Christ. You wouldn't think that's true in America. The gospel has been preached in America for hundreds of years. And yet, even in our generation, there's kids growing up today, they don't know anything about the gospel. They know very little about Jesus. Uh, Easter. Some of these news media people interview people about Easter. They don't have the foggiest idea what Easter is about. It's sad. In America, young people should be ashamed to grow up in America and not understand what Easter is about. But that shows you how far we've gone from the truth. The truth is just not getting out there. And a lot of people don't want to hear the truth. So they refuse to go to a church that will many times tell them the truth if they go to the right church. And just like in Jesus' day, many of them didn't care about the truth. And Jesus, Jesus said, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. If you want to have eternal life, they couldn't grasp that. So God wants us to ask ourselves why do we go to church? Why do we identify as Christians? See, they were interested in what Christ could do for them. They saw him as a prophet, um, and he's feeding them. He's fascinating. But they did not see him as the son of God, the one who's going to set up his kingdom as prophesied in the Old Testament. So the Bible says that in verse 6, chapter 6, verse 66 back in John, that's an interesting chapter and verse, isn't it? John 6, 66. The Bible says that from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. They couldn't handle what he was saying to them. In verse 60, many... Therefore, of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? That's when Jesus says, If you want eternal life, in verse 54, Whosoever eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I'll raise him up at the last day. Well, they couldn't understand that teaching. Because the law, Old Testament law, said you don't eat, eat or drink blood. Went against, it went against the law of God. But the Lord is talking spiritually here. He's telling them a truth that's hidden, and they cannot take the time to discern, what are you saying? He says, I'm the bread, in verse 58, this, this, this is that bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers did eat manna, and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. He says, I'm the, I'm the living bread. If you partake of me, you'll live forever. He's not talking about 
eating his hand, drinking his blood physically. He's giving us spiritual truth. In other words, when you partake of what I do on Calvary for you, my, my body's going to be ripped apart, my blood's going to be shed, and when you apply that to your life and your heart, you will gain eternal life. But application has to be made. Do you have to apply what I've done on Calvary to your own personal life? Jesus, this is getting a little too deep for me. I'm, I'm ready for the buffet. And so Jesus didn't back down from what he was saying. This is the way it is. What are you going to do with it? I find it interesting. We make it easier for people to get saved than Jesus did. Now, it's easy to get saved. It's just believe what he says. But these disciples left him. He didn't, wait, 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 wait a second, don't go. Wait a second, come back here a second. He didn't do that. Now, we would, that, we, we would do that today. We try to convince these people to, to stay. Verse 66, for that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Because they simply could not comprehend what he's saying. Nor the fact that he's asking them to do something. Up until then, it was Jesus that was doing it all. He was healing the people, doing the miracles, feeding them, taking care of their needs. They liked that. Who wouldn't? Now Jesus says, wait a second, let me say something to you folks. Here's what you've got to do. Oh, I've got to do something? Yeah. Yeah, you, you do. You want eternal life? You don't work for it. I'm going to die for you. I'm going to suffer and bleed and give my life for you. You don't have to do anything, but you do have to believe. You do have to trust me. And you do have to appropriate what I've done on Calvary into your life. In other words, you believe it with your life. Not only with your mind, but you believe it with your life. And they said, no, we're not... We're walking away. Now you're asking us to live a different life than Jesus uh, says we'll make a decision. So they walk away. They walk no more with him. Don't expect something out of me. Well, God does expect something out of us. We can't earn our salvation but we can allow the word of God to change us and adapt us into the very person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then we also see there was a, an amazing, not only was there amazing defection, And I'm even amazed that today there are religious groups that teach that when you take communion, you're actually taking the, the body and blood of Christ. They can't, they can't understand that verse still today. So they look at that verse and say, they're thinking physical. Jesus is talking spiritual. I am the bread of life. It's not the, it's not the manna that came down from heaven. The manna that they ate was physical, and those people died. I'm the bread of life. I give life, and you eat of me, you'll live forever. He's talking a spiritual truth. And, and so some of these religions today have taken this passage and tried to make it into something physical. Well, Jesus must be saying that somehow we have to actually eat his flesh and drink his blood. So how can we do that? So they manufacture this. They just simply say that if I say a blessing over the communion, that it becomes, it changes from bread into the blood, 
flesh of Christ. If I say a blessing over the cup, it changes from juice into the blood of Christ. But it doesn't. I mean, you can take it to the chemist and have him analyze it, and it didn't change into anything. But they still will convince you, no, that's now the blood of Christ and the body of Jesus. It's not. Because they can't even understand the passage. He's talking about from a spiritual standpoint, Christ wants to come into your life. He wants to live his life through you and through me. And when we call upon him and ask him to save us and we place our faith and trust in him, we trust him with our lives. So I don't have to eat his flesh. I received what he did on Calvary the moment I got saved. Eternal life is not obtained by taking communion. Jesus Christ is saying that by faith we invite Jesus into our lives and his life becomes our lives. Does your life reflect Christ? Has he transformed your life? Now these disciples have said, I don't want any part of that stuff. So I'm, I'm, I'm through with this. Now the question is, they were never true believers. The same thing with salvation. Jesus doesn't lose those who are truly saved. If you've really been born again, you're not going to walk away from Jesus Christ. Christ comes into your life and changes you. So I understand, I'm, I realize that if you're a child of God, you love him. And regardless of the hardships that come into your life, you're going to continue to cling to the Lord. He has given you eternal life. These disciples were... Ne they, I, I saw a, an article on this. Somebody had written a, an article about this. It says the difference between a fan and a follower. Jesus, they were a fan of Jesus, not a follower of Jesus. And when Jesus let them down, they quit following him. He, he, they were just fans of his. And there's a lot of people out there today probably are just fans of Jesus Christ. Hey, as long as he's cool, as long as he's popular, everything's okay, and I'm looked up to and I'm respected, as long as I identify with him, that's fine. But don't, don't call upon me when things get tough. Don't embarrass me about Jesus Christ. Which reminds me of a little story. A man by the name of Charlie Moore moved into a new community. He took his family. He wanted to make friends, so he joined the local softball league. In the opening game, Charlie took his family to the ballpark and went to join the team. So in the course of time, Charlie got up to bat. He set his feet, squared his shoulders. As the ball came across the plate, he missed by a mile. The crowd groaned, but one voice could be heard over all the people. You can do it, Mr. Moore. The second pitch came, and again he swung wildly and missed. And again the voice could be heard. You can do it, Mr. Moore. The third pitch swung again. The voice cried, that's okay, Mr. Moore. When the game was over, the family got into the car, and as they made their way down the road, the dad turned to his son and said, Was that you that yelled out, You can do it, Mr. Moore? When the son admitted that it was indeed his voice, the dad said he appreciated his son's encouragement, but he says, I wondered, why did you call me Mr. Moore? Well, the boy said, I didn't want anyone to know I was related to you. <laughs> I'll be a fan of Jesus as long as I don't, uh, you know, 
unless it gets embarrassing. <laughs> and so they left him. And so these people who say they're Christians, and yet, you know, church means nothing to them, Christian fellowship means nothing to them, allowing Christ to change their life means nothing to them, probably were never saved in the first place. They may have been a fan of Christ, but they were not a follower of Christ. Oh, they follow him as long as he's feeding them. And so there's no such thing as being halfway committed. You know, we see that in homes today. I sometimes wonder if we don't have a lot of marriages that are simply halfway committed. Well, didn't you ever love the person? Well, yeah, I guess I did. <laughs> that sounds half-hearted. It's tough to be in that kind of a marriage, half committed, half committed. And then we get down to the fact that there's, we see an amazing declaration in verse 67. Jesus looked at the 12 and said, will you also go away? Now here's the 12 disciples. Here's all this crowd, they're leaving me. You going to go too? Okay. Or is everybody going to leave me? Of course not. Because they were true followers of Christ. We go away and then Simon Peter answers him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's commitment. Peter's declaration was one of belief that Jesus alone has the words of eternal life. I'm often amazed at where a person would go today apart from Christianity and Jesus Christ and the Bible. Where else would you go to find truth? Real truth that stands the test of time. Decade after decade, century after century, truth is still truth. And it meets a, it, it meets a high standard. To whom will you go? Who are you going to follow? You're going to follow something. I saw... Um, I might show a picture of it sometime soon. I thought about it, but I didn't have enough time. They're already talking about some kind of a, 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 an alien human that science is trying to create. It says when, it, when they get it created, it's going to be able to speak and respond. And it, they're saying it will even be greater than human. Like, like the computer, it, you know how fast a computer is? This thing will be able to act. They're trying to get into the emotions and the feelings and all that. But they're saying within 30 years, this being will be there. Well, that's where the world's going. They'll create their own God. They think they are God. And so we'll create a God that will represent us. Because who else has truth? Well, I'm glad that the Word of God is truth. It gives you peace. It makes no difference what anybody says. They can laugh at you. They can mock you. And when it gets to the creation account, the Bible says he created the, day, the earth in six days. It means exactly that. And they can laugh at that. And they can mock you and, and make a joke of you. But they don't have truth. They're, they're searching, they're searching and trying to find something opposite and opposed to the Word of God. God can, if God's God, and He is, He can do anything He wants to do. He could have made it in one day if He wanted to. But He chose to do it the way He did it. And so, Peter is very clear. 
Thou hast the words of eternal life. That's why I like the Bible. That's why I like Christianity. I've often said it makes total sense to me. And written over a period of thousands of years, it's remarkable how the continuity supports each other, the writers of the Bible. I mean, what's, what is there to go back to your old life that has no hope? I'm just going to quit going to church. I'm going to quit serving God. For what? What's that going to gain you? You have nothing. You have no hope. Outside of the Lord Jesus Christ and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and all that the Bible speaks about his sacrifice on the cross for your sins and my sins, it's a beautiful, beautiful plan and picture of how Christ redeemed sinners. It tells us where sin came from. It tells us why we're evil. Science hasn't even figured that out yet. And as I've often said too, I don't care if they go to Mars. Elon Musk says that there will be communities on Mars within, I don't know, not too long. There's just going to be sin up there if they ever got there. Uh, <laughs> evil will just be up, up there. And so there's only one source of truth, and it's, it's God and his, and his word. Then in verse 69, Peter says this, For we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. God always has a remnant. He will always have a remnant. And you, my friend, if you're a child of God, you love him with all your heart, you are part of his remnant. You're not going to leave him because you see truth. You understand truth. When he gives you a hard saying, you, you, you get a, clar a clarification of it, and you act upon it. We believe and are sure. That's what God's looking for. He's looking for committed people who accept Jesus for who he claims to be as outlined in the word of God and you trust him with all your heart and soul. Both of the verbs believe and are sure are perfect tense, meaning something beginning in the past and continuing in the present so that the result remains. Peter, what Peter says is we have believed and believe now. We have known and we know now. They had come to a place of belief and they remain in it. And they had come to a state of knowledge and they remain in it. Nothing has transpired over time that has given them any reason to change their mind. And I hope you're just as confident today as you are, as you were when you got saved. I hope you're confident of the deity of Christ. You'll not, you'll not turn your back upon him and his word. I mean, it's tough. Somebody comes in and says, holds a gun to your head and says, are you a Christian? I want you to deny the Lord. You know, it's fear of dying. Powerful. But the fact is, we're all going to die whether you die right then or you're going to die later on, you're going to die. And I'd like to think I would be able to say I'm a Christian. If that means I have to go to be with the Lord right then, then so be it. Because who else is there? Where, oh, there is no other truth. Who else would you follow? so glad God revealed himself in his son, Jesus. It was tough not to see God, uh, not to be able to know God. God in the Old Testament just talked to the prophet and they had to take the prophet's word. And God saw the importance, not only of sending Jesus here to die on the cross, but that people could Spend some time with him 
for a few years to, to get to know how God thinks and God's compassion and God's love and God's forgiveness. And so they were able to actually behold God. Jesus says, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. It's remarkable. When Hernando Cortez landed in Mexico in 1518 to begin his conquest of the New World, one of his first orders to his men was to burn the ships. Cortez was committed to his mission, did not want to allow himself or his men the option of going back to Spain. By removing this option, they forever sealed their opportunity to turn back. And I hope that's where you are. There's nothing else to go to. There's no other source of truth. The Word of God is our truth. And if you can't believe the Word of God, you can't believe anything. There's nothing out there. And we know better than that. In 1 John 2.19, I'll close with this verse. In 1 John 2.19, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been, been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. In other words, that's why they left, is because they never were with us to start with. True Christians do not deny the faith. Truly born again, you'll, you'll just you'll, you'll stay, stay, stay the course. And so John says, yeah, they went out from us, but they were not of us. They pretended to be. While things were going well, while they benefited, sure, why not follow? But the fact is they did leave. But they had they really been true, they would no doubt have committed, continued with us. And that is true. That's why it's always wonderful to see when you go, go into churches and you see the same faces year after year after year after year. And they just stay in the course. They just will always be staying the course. That's God's children. He loves them. They love him. They made a commitment to him. He's made a commitment to them. You'll never perish, but have everlasting life. What a promise. Why in the world would we even... Why, why would a person leave that? And yet they do. It says, many went back and walked no more with him after that moment. Yes, Jesus might ask you to do some tough things. He might ask you to give up some things that your flesh doesn't want to give up. You're better to go ahead with go with God and do what he asks than to try to say, well, phooey, I'm just throwing this whole thing out the door. If you can do that, then you weren't committed to start with. We serve a great God who loves us. If you've never given your life to Christ, do it today. If you have doubts in your mind, I pray that you'll be like Peter when he says, thou hast the words of life. We believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. I'm not going anywhere. You just stay with God. We're going through some tough times in the future. It might even create some doubts in your mind. But don't look back. Just keep on going with God. God will get you out of here in time, all right? Stand with me, please. I'll stay in